disruptive technologies are disinflationary, hugely so, by the way, hugely so. This conversation that we're having right now on a three-way level uh, would have cost maybe thousands, more than more actually, yes, it would cost uh, uh, on the region of ten thousand uh, dollars only fifteen years ago. No, yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, we have also to understand that from the perspective of many governments, the addressing things like climate change, addressing things like uh, world poverty, like uh, uh, the the challenges of uh, global supply and demand of certain level of certain goods and services, all of those things might be uh, obviously very noble causes, but they are also they also have two negative impacts for governments. The first one is that they're disinflationary and governments, especially if they're very indebted, don't like disinflation. The second is that they're hugely, hugely the, uh, disinflationary as well in terms of tax revenues and with governments trying to collect more taxes, it is very difficult. So that's why there is a lot of skepticism about governments leading the action on many of these issues because the, 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 the main um, consequence of developing efficiency, improving blockchain, improving technology, improving in disruptive technologies is disinflation, is less tax revenues, and it's also democratization of um, goods and services, which, it, which reduces the ability of a government to exert control on the population. And how you, uh, uh, what you are told about, uh, I will reformulate what Bill Gates uh, said about, uh, about banks and banking, he, he said, we need uh, banking, we don't need banks. And I reformulated, uh, we need governing, we don't need governments. You are well, comments about this. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know the quote, but what he's basically saying is that there can be the same uh, levels of goods and services that you receive from the financial sector without it being... Uh, provided specifically by commercial banks. But ultimately, if, if Microsoft or Facebook is going to provide financial services, for example, they will be banks. No? So, so the idea that, uh, uh, that you can have uh, banking without banks is not necessarily talking about the fact that there will be no banks. Of course, you know, but that those banks will be Microsoft or Facebook or Tesco uh, or a supermarket, whatever. No, is that banking in itself does not necessarily have to be uh, undertaken by commercial banks the way that we know them today, just the same way as uh, electricity generation doesn't have to be provided by the utilities that we used to know that were integrated with generation, uh, transmission, distribution and supply. So, and the same applies to governments, is that what he is saying, if that quote is correct, is that the, the, the applied principles of society uh, can be exerted in a way that is widespread without the need of an authority, or at least not an authority which will always exist, but definitely with the level of administration and bureaucracy that was needed before, so that you can have the governance Ah. Without the uh, without the number of uh, public servants or the number of politicians that currently uh, we we know, no. So I think that that is basically what he was what he was referring to. Because in, in if I take the quote as correct, actually the quote the quote of Bill Gates was about banking, and I use it to to make formulation for the governments just to let's say to for our use now. Okay. <laughs> you see, I understand. Uh, yeah, and and in this in this uh, line of thoughts, uh, Daniel, uh, do you uh, have or share the opinion that uh, blockchain, especially giving the the possibility for uh, quite uh, widespread decentralization, also could be good tool for 
uh, via decentralization also for uh, minimizing the corruption and the bribery and the administration and these things? Um, to a certain extent. Yes and no. And I'll tell you why. Again, we come back to the point of, of technology is a tool. Hmm? You know, this phone here is a tool. You know? yeah. I can use this phone to make tremendous amounts of good for society, and I can use this phone to throw it to you <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and hurt you. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. What I'm saying is that it in itself, technology is not going to end corruption, blockchain is not going to end corruption because you know there will always be means of, of, of uh, I remember for example when I was a kid that the government in my country decided to um, erase uh, and to stop printing the high high denomination currency no uh, because of uh, to avoid corruption well, but that didn't change anything no uh, and the same way for example one of the countries that has one of the uh, largest levels of um, underground economy, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, one of the top 10 countries in underground economy is Norway. It's a country that is perceived as a country with very little corruption, it's a country with very little, uh, 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 let's say, physical physical currency and very little uh, physical money. A lot of, uh, a lot of it, if not ev almost everything, is digitalized. So, uh, yes, obviously it can, mm -hmm. but like every technology what you need is that the is that there is a that there is a widespread incentive to do so the reason why i use this phone for good to make phone calls to yeah. send whatsapps to whatever to have this conversation and uh, instead of throwing it to people and hurting them in the head is precisely because i perceive that there is a widespread benefit in terms of risk and return of doing things properly okay uh -huh. and, that is, and that is what technology tends to achieve of course the level of corruption that we see today in the in the world looks massive because what because we see it in the media but not because it's higher it's the levels of corruption have fallen dramatically globally no so technology actually does help but it's not in itself, let's say, a magic wand that is going to change those things. What is true is that the level of corruption that existed in the feudal states relative to the level of corruption that exists today in the most corrupt country in the world that you can imagine, okay, has is no comparison whatsoever. Yeah. I was wondering there, um, Daniel, because you mentioned the, um, the term incentive, right? The people... Yeah. Uh, there must be an incentive for people to do, let's say, the right thing. Hmm. And if people are not properly, let's say, incentivized, then they they might as well, let's say, yeah, misuse whatever technology or whatever systems for their own benefit. Well, right? misuse, so, misuse is a very difficult concept because it's a, who says that I am misusing technology? You, who no, decides? Uh, you know I mean? is the, the concept yeah. of misuse, huh? Is a is an afterwards after the fact concept. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Nowadays, I think that everybody might be slightly concerned, if not very concerned, about seeing young kids all day looking at their mobile phones, their iPads, and things like this. Huh? Yeah, correct. That now, after the fact, we might consider that misuse. Okay, but before the fact, when we decided to give iPads to every child in every school, huh? We thought it was a great idea. So yeah. again, we cannot talk about these things from the perspective of uh, uh, of uh, of absolute understanding of what is good and what is bad because it evolves. Hmm? Yeah, we need to we need we for a tool to be misused, we need to understand its full capacity of use. The guy that invented the hammer probably only thought about i don't know uh hitting something on a wall and and uh, instead of instead of doing it with his hand yes uh, and and but the hammer has a number of other uh of other uh uses yes. and uh, the point i'm trying to say is that it evolves okay and that it, the technology itself mm -hmm. 
And the concept of misuse is changes through time. So it changes, and it changes dramatically. Uh, yes. It changes also to the point that something that you perceived was very good a few years ago, now you perceive that it's very bad, and you might perceive that it's very good back in a few years' time. You know? yes. We've seen it with, with, uh, uh, with food, we have seen it with so many things. So the, con the incentives to do something are also changing. You see what I mean? Yes, of the course. The, the, yeah, the incentives to generate and to, to create the best uh, and, and to generate the best return out of, a, out of any given tool of technology is, is something that is evolving uh, consistently and constantly. And um, usually in development, the reason why we call it development is because as we learn more about the abilities or, and, the, and the uses of a technology, it is more evident that we can get better use out of it, okay? Yes, exactly. But ultimately, there will always be, with any technology, always be somebody that finds uh, the laser, which is for Imagine, you know, the laser beam, fantastic invention, okay? Yes. And says, oh, what a great way of uh, cutting a person in half. That doesn't mean that the technology is bad. That means that that person is bad. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I agree with you. Definitely. Yes. yes. Uh, and uh, Daniel, do you have uh, your personal observation during your life, your lifespan, about uh, how people around you and you uh, yourself uh, changed, changed and developed and changed your opinion? about some things oh absolutely oh numerous things numerous things remember when diesel cars were the most environmental decision that you uh, could uh, of a person yeah you, know, you any, any one of us three you're very young uh my father-in-law is in the uh, is in the auto industry so i uh so I get the information we all remember that no we all remember that the decision to purchase a vehicle was usually driving people to purchase a diesel vehicle because it was environmentally more uh, friendly and more efficient. No, well, there you go. Now that has changed completely, and uh, it might change back. I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not saying. And uh, we all remember that uh, so many, so many different uh, changes in in the in the use of technology. For example, we all remember when. We, uh, you probably don't, Denisio, but Vasil and, I, and myself, I am sure we both remember when it was almost considered an atrocity of, of almost monumental proportions to dry your hair with a hair dryer because it was going oh. to destroy the ozone layer. Hmm? Yeah, that is way you. before my time. Yes. That's way before your time, my friend. Yeah. Well, there you go. That is, and, that, and that disappeared, no? So we, yes, there, there, there's constantly things yeah. That we are learn, we, and and it, this is not a bad thing. Is that we evolve, okay? And some of those of, of those ideas might look um, atrocious now, but at the time they served a purpose. Yes, um, I was wondering, eh, as you as you mentioned earlier, and uh, it put me to think. Currently, we see like. Um, um, the question about governments, right? Governments yeah. and the use of blockchain. Yeah. Um, if we look, if we go back, let's say to the reason why, let's say the blockchain was created in the first place, um, just take Bitcoin as an example, right? The mm -hmm. decentralized nature, you know, people were, let's say kind of like fed up with the yeah. current system and thus, you know, hey, the solution was a decentralized, the de decentralized nature that blockchain brought to uh to, to basically to this to the stage yeah now uh this is something that the public uh you and i for seal and a whole global community perceive to be this is the solution to get rid of the middleman to get rid of let's say the centralized power now do you think that it's a good thing for governments to to start using their own blockchains for whatever uses, because obviously it's it goes against the whole spirit of decentralization. 
No, I think that we need to differentiate between blockchain as a technology and cryptocurrencies. One and the other have absolutely nothing to do. Blockchain is a technology that is a technology that that reduces to a bare minimum uh, the the amount of information that need that is required uh, for anything. Okay. And that put that that stores it. That's why it's called blockchain. That stores it very very efficiently and gets from one point to another very very quickly. It's a, it's so it, the, the the use of blockchain on one side and the and the cryptocurrency uh, as a concept of escaping from the from from central bank uh, or government created fiat currencies are different. Even the concept of cryptocurrency itself, huh? a cryptocurrency can be issued by the government. And it's very likely that today, when almost 75, 80% of the utilization of the euro or of the dollar is digitalized anyway, that they will, they, it will evolve into a cryptocurrency. And now, that does not alter the fact that blockchain, again, we're talking about technology and different users. Governments and central banks can absolutely and will and, and are using technology for their own purposes and for yes. what they perceive are the best users of that technology for their objectives. That is not a problem. What it is true is that that same technology is what I called before the democratization of uh, uh, availability of goods and services. Is that that same technology that in uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago would be so astronomically expensive that would make it impossible for you or I as a citizen to undertake those same goods and services. What it's doing is allow me to do it for virtually no cost. So that's the reason why the creation of Bitcoin, the creation of so many cryptocurrencies come Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, ju I just lost you for, for a second. That's okay. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that the is that the, the the idea of cryptocurrencies decentralized from governments, the denationalization of money, is not new. That is not new. If you read Frederick von Hayek's book, the denationalization of money, you will see that he's talking about that already. But he is not talking about that, obviously, from uh, from the perspective of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, because no. the internet wasn't even invented when he wrote the book. No, um, and the utilization of decentralized currencies is something that is not new either. The guy, the, our listeners in Argentina or in uh, so many other countries, remember when communities had to issue their own currencies to exchange goods and services because the banking system collapsed and the, and the currency went down the drain. So that is on one side. Now, what crypto, what, what, what blockchain does and cryptocurrencies achieve is that that aim of trying to get a currency that is a reserve of value, a unit of measure, and a, uh, and a store of, of uh, and, and, and the means of exchange, sorry, means of exchange, unit of measure, store of value, can be created by us, by us three, by anybody else, no? And that it can be done cheaply, effectively, and efficiently. That is the difference. And I think that that responds to the use of, of a technology. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are many, many challenges there. No, the first one is that it has to be widespread, of widespread use. That is, yeah. we're very, very far away from that. Yeah. Cryptocurrencies, even even state created cryptocurrencies, we have seen them in in some countries. No, even yeah. the, the the Chinese government is thinking about creating the the crypto yuan. No? Mm, um, even those need to pass a very steep period of uh, citizens accepting them as those three things, unit of yep. measure, store of value, and um, uh, means of exchange. Yeah. What, what do you think would be, would be required in order to reach this widespread, widespread usage? 
of of we don't know we don't know what makes the euro be a currency that has succeeded to be a widespread means of use among 27 countries with different languages different countries different everything or in fact not even getting along what well, we don't know we never know and this is the beautiful thing about currencies as a, as an expression of money is that the only way in which they become successful is by becoming successful the only yeah. way in, the, in which the cryptocurrency becomes successful is throughout history when the euro was created i remember when the euro was created and i i was speaking with my with my students etc and uh, everybody said this is not going to last this is never going to last how is how is germany going to accept a currency that is hindered by the problems of the of the french and the italians and the spanish and there you go and it's and it's a success it's, a, it's the second most used uh, currency in the world uh the dollar now we have been hearing the the demise of the dollar i've been hearing it since 1991 okay and there it is uh in the meantime 127 currencies since 1991 have disappeared for the same reason so we don't know the only way and that's the beauty of a currency is that the beauty of a currency is precisely the fact that it does not depend on the government or uh, or an international body or even less so a central bank to decide whether it's valuable or not it is decided by the last transaction that is undertaken with that currency which is what uh, Ludwig von Mises I remember reminded everyone you no know, in in in, uh, in his uh, uh, in his books hmm? yeah Vasil would you like to no, no, no. I, I I like very much uh, it uh, also confirmed by my own experience and mathematically uh, I connect this with uh, uh recursive nature or recursive functioning of uh, interesting processes like the process of life the social processes in uh, and also the processes in our minds you know mm -hmm. yeah. you never know you you always discover new things And the, the, the thing about the thing that we need to understand, the thing that we need to understand about um, about currencies is that the it is not whether it is limited supply or gold backed or those things that we tend to say in the or read in many many different. Uh, Uh, places what yeah. is going to make that currency more widely used or more stable i always say to to my followers on twitter and on the social on social media you know what which which currency is the most gold backed currency in the world the ruble is it the most stable currency in the world no it is not it is is it i is it the most um used currency in the world because it's very gold backed no no it's not So there's more, okay? So what is the other element that makes a currency, uh, a currency, be widely utilized? Institutions. It is institutions. It is not how much gold you own in your vaults. It is not how much you tell your citizens that your currency is worth. It is not how much. It is the institutions. Why? Because it's the institutions that will guarantee that when I give you an IOU, a piece of paper, whatever, or a, or a transaction, a digital transaction, saying mm, 1,000 whatever Daniels, mm, that institution is going to guarantee that that 1,000 Daniels is going to be the same for you, Basil, and for you, Denise. It's not going to make it... 50% more expensive for you or 50% cheaper for you. It is a stable value. You see what I mean? So yeah. this is a concept that tends to be ignored in the debate about cryptocurrencies is that the reason why many of those cryptocurrencies fail is because there is no institution behind them 
that guarantees that if I mine or that I use that that Bitcoin or the Ethereum or whatever it is, it's going to continue to be exactly that in a few years' time. And that's confidence. And obviously, we might say, oh, my gosh, and are you going to believe in the banking system with all of its faults? I don't know. But that is going to be created. And that's why what you were saying before, maybe in the future, those institutions, instead of being the commercial banks, might be not Microsoft or Google or Amazon or Facebook. This is where we are wrong. Will be the next Microsoft, Google, Amazon, not those companies. Those will not exist. Those like Yahoo, I mean, obviously Yahoo continues to exist, but it's marginal. Those will be different. So what I'm saying is that it's a very prolonged, long, and difficult process. And the idea that a currency or a cryptocurrency is simply going to become a unit of measure, a store of value, and a reserve uh, uh, is, is absolutely flawed if we don't have behind trustworthy institutions. Institutions, yeah. How would that look like? I'm wondering because, sure. um, I mean, the thing is... No, we don't know. That is the thing. We don't know. We you, might you don't have... have yeah, you, I don't. I don't see like an institution actually. You know, let's say, standing behind Bitcoin, saying, "Okay, hey, you know, I we guarantee the value of, you know, of this asset." I I, I don't see that happen, especially when it comes to uh, yeah, cryptocurrencies. I don't, don't see, see that it today. We don't see it today. We don't see it today because we uh, we we don't because it's not there yet. Huh? Ah, yeah, that's the evolution that, that you spoke of earlier. Good. You see what I mean? That yeah. doesn't mean that is not going to exist. Imagine it. Imagine from for an, for a moment that the utilization of Bitcoin, that Bitcoin, for example, or Ethereum, whatever other. I, I don't like to speak only about Bitcoin, but imagine for a second, for a second, that a cryptocurrency yeah. uh, gets to have, let's say, three percent of global transactions in that currency. Three percent is a lot. Yeah. Just to give you an example, the yuan doesn't get there, no? Huh? So uh, the point is, what can uh, what the, the the institution is likely to be created around and above that element? You see, you will probably have the currency first, and then the institution. Unlike we are used in the fiat system. In the fiat system, you've got the institutions first, the Reserve Bank, yeah. the Reserve Bank in the United States got together, they put together their holdings of gold, they 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 decided to back themselves one with the other, and that gave birth to the US dollar and a widespread utilization of the US dollar. Institutions were first. Yeah. In in the blockchain world, that might not necessarily be the case. But institutions are critical to make them succeed and last. And I, I have a question, uh, Daniel. Uh, do you think that uh, those institutions uh, could be more, more likely with uh, their kernel with uh, what is called uh, digital autonomous organizations? No. It could be. It could be. Is it possible now? No. Now, no. No. Yeah. And the re right now it's not possible. Right, right now it's not possible because the level of, you see, the level of confidence in, in an external digital body that you cannot sort of, that's not tangible, is very low. You know, everybody every day is receiving threats of, of hacking and and, yeah. uh, and spam and things like that. Therefore, but but that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen in the future. We're just literally in the infancy of where we are, of where we will be. You know, and we just think that it's that a lot of things have developed just because they're very different from where they were 15, 20, 30 years ago. Phenomenal change. 
But that does not necessarily mean that it's, we are even close to the beginning. And that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that the reason why we don't, uh, we cannot make a, a prediction of where it's going to be is because the main pillars of a new monetary system have not even yet been uh, developed, not even created. They have not been created. Currently, yeah. if you think yeah. about it, if you think about it, yeah. the main flaw of cryptocurrency is that their their design is exactly the same as a fiat currency, except in the supply of that currency. You see what I mean? So it's like if if I decide to make a disruptive change in communication, and instead of looking at all of the options that we live right now, what I try to do is develop the fax machine. Yeah. yeah. See what I mean? So the problem that I see is that we, we are having a debate in the world about cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies that reminds me, you're also too young to remember, if deciding between VHS or Betamax. <laughs> yes, yes. I, <laughs> no, I was around that time. <laughs> See what I mean? The, that was not the debate. The debate was what would be what would be the vehicle that would that would store and stream uh, the 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 entertainment and information that are that we all wanted. And that obviously was not a machine with a different technology on uh, decryption of, of of a piece of of, of, of plastic. Yes. Uh, and Daniel, do you have any uh, your personal opinion about so-called uh, sovereign identity? Sovereign identity. That again, yes, sovereign identity is like is what we talk. A, a country, a country's sovereign identity is created by its culture and it's cre and it's adopted by its people. The sovereign identity changes over time. You know. You have British people, very, very patriotic. The U United States uh, citizens are very patriotic. The European citizens, not that much. Not that much. The French, yes. The Spanish, not at all. Spanish are always fighting. Yeah, what can I tell you? Ah, Spanish are always way, fighting. Daniel, Daniel since so, how long you are living in Hispany? In sorry? Spain? Since sorry? how long you are living in Spain? Do, how, since how long have we had a king in Spain? No, no, no. Since no, how long you have you been living in Spain? You were born in Spain. I didn't know. Have I been living in Spain? Well, well I lived. Uh, I've lived all over the world, but uh, twenty years. But in any case, the point that I'm trying to say is that sovereign identity is not something that uh, you you control or you create. It just happens. No, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's the reason, and it's also fed, also nurture. Mm -hmm. And sovereign identity is very strong in countries that n nurture it consistently and constantly through culture and through institutions. You go to France, anywhere in France, what are you going to see? A flag. Anywhere. And it's a very yeah. sort of socialist and diverse and many cultures, etc. But the flag is number one. So, so it's not, sovereign identity is not just what people perceive and what people think of and what people feel, but the way it is nurtured and maintained through culture and institutions as well. Yes, this is sovereign identity, but my question, I wanted to put it about the, to this one, which is called self-sovereign identity. Self-sovereign identity, which is used in blockchain circles. For this, do you have any... Well, what is self well, I don't understand it. Uh -huh. You cannot have you cannot have, in my opinion, the concept of self sovereignty. Because that, that means nothing. I, I I say I'm the king of my world. I say I'm the king of my world. Phenomenal. Congratulations. The reason why there is sovereignty. Sovereignty is not is not something you declare. It's something people give to you. Okay, maybe uh, the term should be reshaped. Uh, but the idea behind is uh, that uh, 
data, personal data, belong to person, this, this there is data. No such thing. There is no such thing. The, the, as, as technology develops, mm -hmm. the, 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 we consistently and constantly give up personal independence because of a greater good, whatever it is. Yes. Better, so, better, this is a good. deal. This is a deal no. we made with the devil, you know? <laughs> no, 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 it's not a deal we make with the devil. No, 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 no. You don't make a deal with the devil uh, when you're receiving more than what you get, than what you give. The deal with the devil is the opposite. Hmm? Uh, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that this discussion that we're having right now, we're talking about blockchain and, and Bitcoin and all these things. I guarantee you that in my next search on the internet, the first couple of things that may come up on YouTube or whatever will be blockchain and Bitcoin. That does not mean that my sovereignty or my independence is being compromised. That is a service to me. See what I mean? So that is that is something that we always give, you know, we always do, always give. I remember when the first mobile phones came up that the entire discussion about mobile phones was the fact that anybody with a, uh, with an antenna could listen to your conversations. Okay, fair enough. Thank God we have, and, and there we are, and, there, and thank God for mobile phones and for so many other things. No? We, it, it, with the advance of technology, your ability to remain uh, outside of public knowledge is diminishing, always. It's diminishing always. It diminished the moment that you received a postal code, and it diminishes the moment that you receive a mobile phone, etc., etc., etc. So I, this concept that your data, your information, and your entire universe is going to be circumscribed to you and not available to the rest is nice, but it's not going to happen. Okay. Hey, guys, I, um, Daniel, yeah. thank you. I, I want to wrap it up, but I really want to thank you very much, Daniel, for um, yeah, for coming on again. You know, on the on the show, it's really been a pleasure speaking to you. I feel like we can go on for hours and you know just touching different topics. And That's very you are you're a very re resourceful person. And um, honestly speaking, I hope we can speak to you again in the future, um, whatever topic that may be. But um, thank you very much. But for now, um, I just want to give a recap of you know who you are. Uh, we have here, you know, economist and fund manager, uh, is the author of the best-selling books of life in the financial markets, The Energy World is Flat, and Escape from the Central Bank. Um, ranked as, let's see here, ranked as one of the top 20 most influential economists in the world in 2016-2017 by Richtopia. And you hold a CIA financial analyst title. Um, yeah, you're also a regular collaborator with CNBC, Bloomberg TV, BBC, Hedge, Hedge Eye, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, you are a person well-known and all around the place. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's been an absolute pleasure and a great discussion and a great interview. Thank you so much for your questions and always available to you. Have a good day. Thank you Thank very you. much, Daniel. Take Thank care. You. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.